bringing you an interview with Harry Truman. Now, I hadn't seen the former president since his very serious illness last summer, so with many vital events taking place in the world and a historic election having shaken up Congress, I went out to Kansas City to ask Mr. Truman what he thought about some of these things. And in just a minute, I'll be back with Mr. Truman's own forthright views on the state of the world. Mr. President, it's certainly nice to see you looking so well. I remember the last time I was in Kansas City, a lot of folks were really worried about you. I'm very happy to have recovered so quickly and in such good shape. I'm a little bit weak in the knees, but in a short time I'll be just as good as ever and be on the job doing business. Well, I'm delighted, and if you don't mind, I'd like to fire a few questions at you the way we used to do in the old press conference days. Go ahead. I'll answer them if I can. If I can't, I'll tell you I can't answer them. Fine. Well, you know, speaking of... Uh, health and so on. There's some very vigorous uh, young men in the Senate these days. Senator Green of Rhode Island, aged 87, and Matt Neely of West Virginia, aged 81. Well, you're just a youngster in, in, in comparison. How about you coming back to the Senate? Well, of course, it's a temptation, but we have two wonderful senators in the great state of Missouri, and I hope that they'll stay there as long as they want to. They represent Missouri as Missouri has never been represented before, and I can say that because I was a representative in the Senate for Missouri for 10 years. Well, I agree with you. Well, some time ago, Governor Dewey suggested that, to me, that every ex-president should be a member of the Senate. What do you think of that? When I was in the Senate, I suggested that that happen, that uh, former presidents and former Vice Presidents should have the freedom of the floor of the Senate and the House for the purpose of discussing measures that were before those two bodies and receive the pay and emoluments of a senator but have no vote. It didn't get very far with it, and I'm in a position now where I can't publicly advocate it. I, well, I can understand that. Now, getting a little bit political, what would you say was the biggest factor which caused the Republican setback in the recent elections? I think the promises they made in the campaign of 1952 and didn't keep, and the very fact that they represent special interests and have shown conclusively that they always represent special interests is what defeated them. What would you say about Steve Mitchell's idea that Vice President uh, McNixon, as some people call him, should apologize to the Democrats? Well, the Democrats, I think, took care of that in the election. I see. You don't think Ike will make him apologize? I don't think he will. Well, you know, Jimmy Burns' new senator from South Carolina is making noises as if he were going to vote with the Republicans in the organization of the Senate. I've always wondered, you once were going to nominate Jimmy Burns for vice president in Chicago, I think, in 44. What, what was it that turned Jimmy sour on the Democrats and... I haven't the slightest idea. The Democrats did everything possible for Mr. Burns. I was very fond of him. I went to Chicago and at his request had promised to nominate him because he informed me that President Roosevelt was back of him for a vice president. I did everything I possibly could to get him nominated. And on Thursday afternoon, I found out that the president wanted a man from Missouri for, for vice president, and that man from Missouri didn't want the job but he had to take it when the president asked him to take it. Well, that is certainly a memorable spot in history. I'll go into it in detail when my book's published. Well, I'll, I'll, a lot of people will, will be waiting to see that, read that book. Another interesting spot in history, this, there was a lot of talk during the campaign about the Korean truce as being a great victory. I had heard that prior to the 1952 election that you had a chance to make a truce in Korea. I could have signed a truce in Korea any time before that, several weeks before that, if I'd been willing to agree to the Russian terms, which I was not. I didn't want to see those uh, prisoners returned and slaughtered, and well, that was the reason that I wouldn't agree to the truce that the Russians wanted. And also, I didn't feel that the uh, truce in Korea should be made a political matter. It was not a political matter. It was a United Nations action to save the Republic of Korea, and it was a worldwide affair and not a, an American political thing. Mr. President, I understand that your mother, when you were a boy, had you read the Encyclopedia Britannica from cover to cover. Well, that's a little misapprehension that some people may have. When I was going to school in Independence, Missouri, between the ages of 10 and 17, 
I read all the books in the Independence Library, a very good library for a town of that size at that time, about three or 4,000 volumes, and included in that uh, library were a number of encyclopedias, and I read them all. And it was a, a virtually an education in itself, and a most interesting uh, program for me because I couldn't see, and I couldn't play baseball and football and things of that kind. Sometimes in the baseball games they had me for an umpire because I couldn't see. And I spent most of my time reading. And that's uh, where that story originated. Well, and I understated it. As a matter of fact, now I can understand why you are so interested in history. You know, as a newspaper man, I've sometimes thought that uh, we of the press, and I've been guilty myself, have been unfair to our presidents. And, uh, did we slander our presidents? Uh, where, 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 was the press unfair to our presidents in the early days? Oh, yes. I don't know. Uh, they were never prosecuted for slander, but then uh, in, in some instances they vilified the presidents terribly. That was true in Washington's time, particularly, and in Jefferson's and Jackson's. And Lincoln was about the most abused president there was in the White House by the northern press, which was supposed to be supporting him. And you know what's happened in the recent times with Wilson and Roosevelt and for the one you're talking to. I do. Well, looking back on your long career, what would you like to have go down in history as your greatest achievement? Well, that's hard to say. You see, uh, everything when it happens at the time, with a number of crises that were uh, coming up all the time while I was president of the United States, a man thinks that that one is the most important thing, and when that's settled, that'll be the greatest thing in the whole setup. But uh, look at those things from a historical standpoint, uh, 20 or 30 years from now may change the situation entirely, and I'm not in a position to say what was the greatest thing. It was all trouble enough, I can tell you that. Well, if you would allow uh, an outsider to make an observation, I've sometimes thought your stand on civil rights would go down as one of the greatest. Well, uh, that is uh, something that I believed in, something that I helped to write into Democratic platforms because I usually was on the resolutions committee at the Democratic conventions, and I tried to carry out what the Democratic platform called for and what the Constitution of the United States says is the law. Well, the Supreme Court is, has caught up with you. <laughs> and I've also thought that your stand on the tr your Truman Doctrine for Greece and Turkey were terribly important. What? What well, were the facts behind that? Well, here, he must uh, take this, uh, that as a one situation. It was the foreign policy of the United States at that time to save the free world. In order to save the free world, it was necessary that uh, the Russians uh, move out of uh, uh, Iran. It was necessary to keep them out of Greece and Turkey. It was necessary to keep them from taking Berlin. It was necessary for the rehabilitation of all the free countries for the Marshall Plan to do what it did and for Point Four to come in. They're all a part of the foreign policy of the United States to prevent the Russians from making the world totally communist. And that's what the objective was, and I think we accomplished it. Well, I would say that you did. I would like to ask you, as a student of history who studied Napoleon and his attempt to conquest Russia and also uh, Hitler's uh, attempt to overrun Russia, whether you think that Russia ever can be uh, conquered? No, I don't think Russia can ever be conquered any more than the United States can be conquered. The people think too much of their country there. Well, now, one final question. As a man who probably did more than anyone else to stop Russia in Europe, do you think we can live with Russia in peace in the future? We can't very well live with Russia in peace with its present totalitarian government. But the Russian people are good people, just same as the people of the United States and the people of Britain and the people of France are good people. And those people in those countries that I've just named have been through difficulties and eventually they've worked out of them because the good people usually come to the top sometime or other. I'm just as sure as I sit here, the good people of Russia will have a free government with which we can carry on uh, relations and business just as we do with England and France. Well, I certainly hope that's right, and thank you very much indeed. You're entirely welcome. Now, Mr. Truman gave me his views on so many interesting subjects that, frankly, I couldn't squeeze them all into one telecast. So I have what I think is rather a fascinating interview with Mr. Truman on his private papers, which I'll give you in, a, in another telecast very soon. 
Meanwhile, one remark the ex-president made just a second ago struck home especially, namely that the people of Russia are good people and that we can live with them when they have a free government. Now, I've had the same feeling myself, and I've been harping on the idea that we must break down the Iron Curtain or get around the Iron Curtain somehow to show the people of Russia that we are peace-loving people and not the hate-mongers the Moscow radio makes us out to be. I am so convinced on this that I went over to the Czechoslovak border some time ago and helped release several thousand balloons carrying 11 million leaflets, which we dropped behind the Iron Curtain to tell the people over there that we are their friends. Now, one trouble with our country today is that we've been so busy worrying about ourselves and about McCarthy and his charges that we've forgotten what Mr. Truman just said, that the Russian people are good people, just the same as the people of the United States. So I would like to urge the American people to support the crusade for freedom in its fine work of winning over the people behind the Iron Curtain and making democracy live.